Hello, everyone, and welcome to Global Wealth Advisors' fourth quarter outlook. I'm Keith Sprout, Chief Investment Officer here at GWA. Though we did expect volatility to last until the end of the year, the severity of the market downdrafts have caused challenges in managing investment portfolios. Historically, we are in an extraordinary period for the markets. Now, performance has been top of mind for everyone. There have been very few asset classes with positive performance this year, just commodities, cash, and some alternative investments. You can see from the performance quilt here how difficult it's been, even though we've seen numerous rallies during the year. This data is through the end of the third quarter, and one of the items that we'll touch on is the unusual behavior of the stock and bond markets moving significantly in the same direction. I would say that the biggest influence during the past 12 months or so on the financial markets has been inflation. When we look forward, we have to look at it through the lens of the central banks. We are in a rare time period where good news for the economy is bad news for the markets. And this is because good economic news points to more inflation and to a Federal Reserve that feels it can continue to raise short-term rates to quell that inflation. There's an expectation out there that we not only have to see various inflation indicators peak, but we need to see them drop substantially. And the reason we need to see them drop substantially is that the Fed has indicated over and over that they want to see inflation using their preferred indicator of the personal consumption expenditure index at 2%. So as we have seen in the most followed inflation index, the CPI, a drop from July to August to September of 8.5 to 8.3 to 8.2 in the headline CPI is just not going to be enough, particularly when core CPI, which takes out food and energy for July, August, and September, was 5.9, 6.3, and 6.6. So the graph that we're looking at shows CPI for the last 50 years. And we, see, we haven't seen these kind of inflation numbers for about 40 years. And we are well above the 50 year average, which includes the 1970s, which saw some very high inflation. So inflation is still an issue, particularly in the areas of shelter, food, and medical care. Historically, the Fed tends to wait too long to act and then do too much, which can result in accentuating instead of taming the business cycle. And what we see here is 20 plus years of the Fed funds rate. And this is the rate that the Fed sets and it's used by banks for overnight lending. And the real takeaway here is that unless we're in a period of financial collapse, such as post the Great Recession in 2008 or the pandemic, the Fed tends to be in motion. And with all the forces moving the U.S. economy to keep their dual mandate of stable prices and full employment, there is a lot of tinkering to be done. The Federal Reserve released its most recent predictions for the Fed funds rate after their meeting last month. Uh, and all 19 Fed bank presidents vote on where they think the Fed funds rate will be going moving forward. And we see something interesting. As we look out past this year into 2023, it looks like the Fed funds rate is going to peak and it starts to come down pretty quickly after that, as you can see from that gold line. And that gold line represents the median of the estimates. It also shows there's not a great deal of consensus as we get past 2023. So by this chart, we don't know what they're predicting will happen at each meeting, but my best guess is that they'll be done with significant tightening by the end of the year. I would say that last quarter's biggest economic news was the slowdown in the housing market. The slowdown is one of the most direct impacts of the Fed's tighter policy. As a national average, a 30-year fixed mortgage rates increased from 3.3% at the start of the year to just over 7% at the end of September. And as we've spoken about in the past, the housing market has a lot of inroads to the economy, both in the good side of it, uh, like furniture, sinks, and showers, and the services sectors, landscapers, painters, plumbers, and so on. So as those rates move up, it has a direct impact on the economy. And it's not just the rates spiking up. 
you can have high mortgage rates and still have people willing to pay and to keep the housing market strong. But in this instance, you can see the effect of both the high level of mortgage rates and the prices have come down a bit, the still elevated home prices forcing buyers to wait. So what we're looking at on this graph is mortgage applications that go back from 1990s uh, through October 7th of this year. And you can see how steep the drop off in applications have begun. And I think this shows an obvious cause and effect of higher rates, in this case, mortgage rates, slowing in particular an important area of the economy. One of the points that has been made often about the, the current cycle is that the Federal Reserve can continue to increase rates as long as the economy hasn't moved into a deep recession and there is still strength in the economy. And the biggest area of economic strength today is the labor market. So what we really need to happen, as contrary as it may seem, is for the labor market to uh, slow down and to give up some of the gains that we've seen in order to signal to the, the Federal Reserve that it's okay for them to, to either take a pause or to stop completely. And what we're looking at in this graph is job openings over the past 12 months. And you can see that back in March, we were close to or heading towards 12 million job openings. And you can see that although it's a, a little bit lumpy, we've gotten down to job openings that are closer to 10 million openings. And that's a substantial move in the right direction if it holds. So that's one thing that the Federal Reserve may be looking at. Another thing that the Fed is looking at is non-farm payrolls. Again, we wanna see those payrolls coming down to show the Fed that the labor market isn't as strong as it once was. And you can see it, that many of the various data points that I've been showing are very lumpy. And we see occasional setbacks as we're moving in the right direction. And what we're looking at here with the payrolls data is we saw a spike in the July payroll, and that was due to large gains in certain areas, particularly leisure and hospitality. But then we continue to move lower. And when we look at this data, we see the same pattern. Supply and demand are slowly moving towards equilibrium, but not quick enough for the financial markets. So last month, we saw a number of non-farm payrolls or new jobs at 263,000. And that was the lowest we have seen in a while. But the expected number was even lower at 250,000. And because the true data didn't mean the expectations, the market dropped significantly that day. We've touched upon how bad performance has been this year. The good news is that the poor performance we've seen has dropped the market to reasonable levels from a broad market standpoint, like the S&P 500. But it's also brought the multiples or the PE ratios down from what many consider to be unsustainable highs. And what we're looking at here is the forward PE ratios for the S&P 500 from 1999 all the way through October 10th of this year. And remember that forward PE gives you what's expected over the next 12 months versus trailing PE, which looks back 12 months. And this gives you a sense of where we've been over the last 20 years or so, and what has happened in the very recent past. And what we saw as the pandemic restrictions were easing is a spike up in equity prices, causing PE multiples to rise substantially, and then seeing them fall as we moved into our current situation. So we've just begun the, uh, the third quarter earnings season. So we'll see if the E portion of the PE changes causing projections of the overall market levels to change. But valuations for the stock market are much closer to fair value than we've seen recently, which should help with performance on a going forward basis when this part of the cycle is over. I added this next slide because it's interesting to see how out of line PEs can become in different time periods. And what this graph is showing is a 50 year historic average for the S&P 500, which is that zero line. The other horizontal lines are one and two standard deviations from that average. And many people believe that over time there is a reversion to that mean. By looking at the far right of this graph, as of October 7th, 
we are still above that 50 year average, but not nearly as much as we were. We were over two standard deviations from the average, and now we're less than one standard deviation from that average. And that's a much more reasonable place to be if we're going to get any kind of a market rally. This chart shows various uh, maturities for the United States Treasury bonds and below that various sectors of the fixed income markets. And what really jumps out is how poorly the fixed markets have performed. A lot of this is due to the aggressiveness of the Fed. Uh, fixed income securities can handle increasing rates which causes the prices to decline if they are drifting higher over time. A slow rise in interest rates allows for bond coupons to come in and offset those losses from higher rates. So our current situation has seen rates increase so fast that there isn't enough time for that smoothing of performance to occur. And keep in mind when looking at the treasury performance, treasuries have no credit risk or risk of default. The principal and interests are guaranteed by the US government. So these losses are driven solely by moving higher of interest rates. And another point to mention while looking at the performance for this part of the market, fixed income in general, is investors who are in a more conservative allocation or, or investing for income haven't been benefactors of a poorly performing equity market or poorly performing areas of the economy. They're also seeing very poor performance. Just how poor has performance been for the fixed income markets? This chart goes back more than 45 years. And though it's a little busy in this presentation, it gives us some very insightful information. We are looking at performance for the aggregate bond index. This is the broadest measure used for investment grade fixed income. The bars show yearly performance. The dots show the biggest drop in performance for each of those years. So by way of example, if you look to the far left of the chart, it shows fixed income performance for the year 1976. That year had positive performance of 16%, but at some point during that year, there was a drop in performance of 1%. So if you move all the way to the right, you can see where we are currently. And even though uh, there's a few months left in the year, uh, we're still having a very, very difficult time uh, in the fixed income markets by any measure. So, what we see is that it's very common for pullbacks to happen during the year, but for the year to finish out with positive performance. I think we can say that it's uncommon to see the fixed income markets have yearly negative performance. This is only the fifth time over this 45 year period that we are seeing negative performance. And again, this is an outsized down years. One of the points to keep in mind is that moving forward, investments are in very good positions to capture higher yields. That can be from reinvestment of coupon payments, or if you're in a mutual fund, at some point I would expect inflows to these funds to increase, and that new cash will be used to buy securities with higher interest rates. The other thing that'll happen is at some point, the Federal Reserve will indicate that they are stopping the rate hikes, and the markets will begin pricing in future rate cuts, which will enable fixed income prices to increase. So far, I've been focused on the U.S. markets because it's a big part of what we invest in. But the story can be repeated around the world. Global central banks are very concerned about inflation and are doing their best to use the tools at their disposal to slow demand. But they have additional issues to contend with. China is dealing with continued COVID lockdowns, the war in Ukraine, energy issues in Europe, and policy errors that we're seeing in the U.K. So we get something similar. From this slide, you can see that the international valuations versus US valuations have declined more. We spoke about forward PEs for the S&P 500 being around 15 times. You can see here from the left-hand side of this chart that international PEs are closer to 10 times. From the graph on the right, you can see that dividend yields in the international markets are up substantially as well. Some different challenges but there could be opportunities to increase exposure here in the months to come. There are a lot of ways to look at historic data as we have in the past. I've mentioned a few times about market history and the elections. In this particular chart, we're seeing performance of the S&P 500 from November of the midterm year and six months out towards April 
of the following year. And this data goes back to 1950. And though there have been varying degrees of positive performance, all the performance has been positive. This six month period has always been positive. As we're less than a month away from midterms, it does look like Congress will be split, which can cause larger, more disruptive legislation from getting through. Again, as discussed in the past, the markets do like that. Looking at a broader time frame, it's important to note that as we're seeing in this graph, going all the way back to the Second World War, that bull markets have lasted longer than bear markets. Uh, in this graph in particular, the blue periods are bull markets, the orange periods are bear markets. The average duration of a bull market during this time period has been 4.4 years. The average duration of a bear market during this time period has been 11.1 months. And without getting into all the specific hills and valleys that you see here, the true takeaway is that there are market cycles. We live through market cycles, but you have to get through the orange to get to the blue. And lastly, I added a new slide that lists some current items I feel can help the markets and some items that could hold us back. It's by no means exhaustive, but it should give you a sense of of what's moving the markets. And when we're looking at headwinds, we're talking about things like consumer confidence being low. We've spoken a lot today about an aggressive central bank, the global tensions. The dollar is very, very strong. There's been some global currency issues, China and their COVID lockdowns. I mentioned Europe and UK energy costs and uh, economic policies. And on the tailwind side, uh, I think that it's going to be a question of a little bit of patience as we get these tailwinds. So lower stock valuations, higher interest rates, the housing market declines. Remember, we're looking at this through the lens of the Federal Reserve. The supply chains are starting to ease. Inflation is starting to come down. Manufacturing is slowing, and I think that the midterms are gonna be a big benefit to the markets. So as always, from everyone at Global Wealth Advisors, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next quarter.